and it's always exciting to f to find a lamp that is fulfilling the needs that I was looking for those years ago. Well, dado rights have been the forerunners in development in terms of the quality of light that's produced and the, ma the quality of manufacturing in that they're beautifully made. I think we bought our first set of dado lights as a unit probably late 80s, early 90s, I can't remember the exact date, I and mean, it was a, a set of four uh, 100s, classic 100s, and it was just like, Plus, <laughs> we've got a light we can focus. We can, yeah, you know, we can lock it in position, and you gradually get used to them. And those two, the the one hundred and the one fifty, really have been a workhorse now for us on model shoots. You know, for over twenty years. Initially, the innovation of day day light was um, fearless. Really, I, I just thought, what a what a wonderful. It was designed from the ground up. It wasn't. It wasn't just another version of a Fresnel lamp. It was actually designed as okay. Let's what's what's wrong at the moment with lamps, you know? And it was all so old. These things came along and they just they started fresh, new from the ground up. As I say, it's a great lamp. Uh, this new range continues. It's not just a case of a big paint roller. It's a beautiful fine. Uh, bristle brush that you've actually painted gently exactly where you want the light to go and these tools allow you to do that. So when the dado came along it, changed, it was kind of like a game changer then um, you know for certain situations where you needed small precise lighting but nowadays it's even more of a game changer because nowadays whereas before I'd have a set of dados for pack shots you know, you, you have a pack shot immediately, every gaffer in the country knows this, and pack shot dado. But now I'm looking at dados for f serving way, a uh, far wider multitude of, uh, of purposes. We're in the middle of an enormous shift in lighting technology, yes. and I've seen this in my own work, yeah. that once upon a time, everything had to revolve around where the power point was in the room. Yes, you could run cables, but now we've got tremendous lights yes. that do not need to be plugged into the wall, yes. battery operated, and you're not compromising with what you're getting. So give us some feedback on where we're at with this sort of technology. Well, look, I'm standing in front of it, aren't I? I mean, the, the thing is that you can, you know, anybody could go to a, to a supermarket or a of you know one of those sort of homeware stores and buy LEDs but the quality from them is mean, pretty good it's okay but if I'm after I'm after the correct color and if I'm after you know the quality of light that's what I'm looking for so what is quality of light the, the color of it the color temperature is correct the the um, the and the evenness of the light that's for me is what it's all about a 40 watt lamp which is balanced to, um, to daylight and it's got a wonderful range of swap and flood and it can dim and it, it's just extraordinary that and, and it can come off the mains or battery 12 watt or two volt. so I mean that's to think what you can get out of that and it's daylight color yes it's yeah. incredible gosh it's good isn't it <laughs> it's a lovely light, isn't it? Look how even that is. And it's got a big range. Good Lord. Yeah. It's got a nice cut, hasn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. Naturally, that is just a very good, small Fresnel lamp that works off a battery. A battery that lasts for ages. <laughs> Just using battery power like gives you so much, just broadens your horizon so much. You limit your time of setup and breaking down. Um, you can basically set up almost anywhere without having uh, the need of, of, of having like cables, power cables, and, and, and electricity in general. You just turn up somewhere, boom, two lights are up there. They're good, good and fast. Really, the lights that get the most work are my dados, my little 150 watt. Uh, uh, you know, lightheads about this big, and they're incredibly versatile. When we were doing a job recently, we actually had the dados um, sort of uh, constantly wired up just on long um, XLRs, um, just so that we could just quickly walk them in. They are honestly the cleanest, 
light out there and as a photographer it was really important for me. Um, I'm not necessarily from a film background but I knew about lighting and knew about the quality of light was really important. I was surprised to see how powerful it was. The reason I was interested in it was because of its spot flood range which is I believe 20 to 1. So you do get more range than any other light that I know of. What got me initially was just the fact that you could dim them. Just the fact that there was a built-in dimmer and that made such a difference. And then I understood what the focusing ability was about. The focusing principle of the original light is still very, very special about the data light. I mean, there's no other light that quite has integrated that focusing that the projection system that the data light has and none as good I mean if you are looking for a small unit that can focus like that there is no better light this is the DLH4 see how bright that is it's incredibly powerful little lamp and people say can I key with that do you want to sit under that for two hours exactly it's not comfy but it's a powerful little lamp uh, what I'm going to show you is something called a DP1. This is a little attachment that fits on the front <coughs> of the dado lights. It has a lens on the front of it. What this allows you to do, because you've attenuated the light off the background, you can do things with it. This is a little bit cheesy, but it's an idea of how you can simply and easily change the texture of that background. <coughs> You can put colors, whatever you like, into it, but it's giving you the flexibility to manipulate your background in terms of what it looks like, <clears throat> in terms of its texture. If you've got a flat, boring background, please, please, please don't get the cheese plant and drag it in. You see it all the time. It's just to get rid of that boring, flat background. There's a million and one gobos that be made. The company called Roscoe make them. They're brilliant. This is uh, one of the standard kind of um, leaf breakups. But what I wanted to show you is <clears throat> at the moment, where does that background appear to be in terms of the subject? This is really important in terms of, again, the psychology of showing people an image and getting the image to actually tell a story. At the moment, that background is slapped behind the person's head. But what you can do with this is watch very carefully as I throw this out of focus. Look what your head does and tells you about the image when the background goes soft. Suddenly, as the background goes soft, the subject comes away from the background. And instantly, you get a feeling that there's a distance there. And that distance is important because even though that wall could be a couple of feet away, if you project an out-of-focus soft image on it, it will give you the impression that you've got something three-dimensional there because your brain says if it's out of focus, it's got to be further away. So again, instantly, you're starting to create the illusion, this illusion that you've got something three-dimensional there, which is quite exciting when in a really simple situation, this is just a talking head against a wall. So, you know, you can play with all sorts of colors, shapes, etc., etc., to to get interesting, interesting backgrounds and colors. It doesn't take an awful lot of effort with these tools because they're just designed to do this simply. They're designed by cameramen who know what we need to actually make craft simple, quick images. What I love is, I love the quality of his, like the sharpness. They're so, you know, crisp, yeah. Yeah, they're crisp and, and you know it's going to be even left to right, mm. top to bottom. It's lovely. Yeah. Obviously, you've got the optics of the dado, which uh, are groundbreaking, as we discussed earlier, you know, kind of game changing in a sense. Um, and you've got the continuity of some of the accessories. I mean, I already have some tungsten uh, LED, uh, dados. Uh, so the fact that I can use the barn doors, the um, lens on all of the lights, it makes sense to uh, 
to invest in some LEDs and have that as part of the kit. Even the little LEDzilla, the one LED light is absolutely incredible. I'll use it for product shots and get that dynamic lighting. The new 20 watt, kind of what we've got here, is incredible to be honest with you. It's something you can put in a bag, you don't need a big heavy bag to it. I actually shoot stills as well as video with these and my favourite has got to be the 40 watt. So that's something that I will take away. I've got 40 watts of power, I can scope it, mould that light, which is incredible. Having a battery powered, no brainer. It is. And they last a long time, it's not like they run out. It's massively changed from brutes, carbon arc lights, now to LEDs that run off of a, you know, a battery on the back with the equivalent output some of these things have got, of 2.5 kilowatt daylight lights. So yeah, it's massively changed. Dado's new range, which can all be driven with batteries, and you know, essentially you can walk into an environment, possibly not plug anything in. It's the control, the versatility, and and the fact that they're so well made. Using data light has always been awesome because I could just pack many lights in, in, in a small case, be portable, light, fast, and you know, very importantly as well, it's they're very, very rugged. So, you know, I can travel and I, I'm sure where I'll go, they'll still be working. I really like the look of getting the, the rim light around the back of the person. So I specifically for this shoot wanted a hard light to fire behind the subject to just give a bit of a, a nice backlight, which is why I chose the DLED4. You've got a dimmable light source, you've got battery power, so there's very little cables running around. And again, the fact that it's dimmable is just superb. So you can flood the light, you can have a nice wide spread if you need to. And of course you can use the barn doors in a typical way you would with any dado lighting. So what we've essentially got is an LED version of the DLH4s, exactly the same flexibility, except you're mobile, you've got a battery pack, you don't need to be powered, you can use it anywhere. Dado, I've had friends or... I think a lot of people haven't really necessarily looked at them in detail lately because I've spent a little time on the booth today, in the booth here at, at Cinegear, and just looked up a few prices and I'm like, oh, they're actually at least comparable and sometimes cheaper than the, the competing product. It is staggering. The quality and the, the way that one can change colour temperature is, you know, that's, that's, that's magic. The fact that you can turn a knob and go from daylight to tungsten, you know, that's, that's just magic. So, so it's great days. It's great days in lighting. Dado's new range of LEDs are a revolution. They're just coming out. They're going to change the way people run around and do certain jobs. And maybe people will... Hello, thank you for joining. Welcome. I'm Dado. Uh, today's active participants is our team of collaborators from Düsseldorf, Germany, with Michael Quack and Gregor uh, Bienek, who will guide and manage today's session. Then from Dado Tech Russia, our team from Moscow, which is led by Leonid Predorogan, a friend from 1961, and longtime professional Natalie, newcomers Carol and Maria, today presented by Dima Andreev. They are still under very severe restrictions and uh, can't really move very much. So Dima pre recorded his participation. And we may also have a live participation from the Russian DOP, uh, Peter Duchovskoy, talking about his experience with Datalight Lightstream. Third, from Datalight California, managed by Marianne Expariat, we will have the presentation from Sean Boydriven from the wonderful Los Angeles showroom, temporarily without any guests inside because of the restrictions and very special care. Sean will give us a glimpse of some of our new developments and some of the future. And number four, 
that's us, our Munich presence, supported by Alex Berkovich, taking care of the live lighting and projection, Mark Erdmann covering the technical aspects, Roman Hoffmann and Ute Meisenheimer supporting and guiding. Uh, my subjects don't have too high expectations, will cover more traditional aspects. So there will not be a great variety. This will be left to future sessions to cover some of our latest developments, which will be Lightstream Light, Lightstream Tabletop, and some brand new tools to perfect the control of Data Light Lightstream and add some hence unknown extensions to the system. Um, so let's just go ahead and let's transfer to our Düsseldorf team. from Düsseldorf. This is Michael again at the Visual Pursuit Studios uh, welcoming you to the second edition of our international presentation. And again, Dedo already mentioned, these little bees will play a major role in our presentation today. And we have prepared a small video with a very frugal setup. Um, the lemon in classical art is uh, a symbol of uh, frugality and that's what we um, set up as well in the studio, a still life scene with the lemon bowl, and it's just one lamp below the table, and the rest is done by light stream. Um, yeah, let's go from the engine room, and I'll comment on the video and uh, explain what we did. Go. So, you see the table with the lemon bowl. Below the table is the D-Light 10, and there's a number of um, reflectors um, positioned, very lightweight stuff, so you just need a little uh, grip, you just need a few lightweight stands, you don't have to haul so much uh, material to your set. Um, there's E-Flect on the right side, one in silver, one in gold. There's um, small panels on, um, to... to um, yeah, you see me? holding uh, the lamp, you see me holding the, uh, the, the single reflectors, and you can see in the small picture what happens in, in the frame itself. Um, I do this in two, two rounds, so after first round there's the second round, and you can see what happens. We have a fill light, we have a spotlight on, on some of um, um, the lemons, and we have um, a, an, an overall key light that's coming from the top. And all of this was just one lamp sitting below the table. Can you imagine that all this is done with a lamp below the table? This is gorgeous, absolutely. And you have so many possibilities. So it's E-flect, you see the, the sparkle on, on the table. And this is the fill light with another one. And you see with this little fog implemented where the light is going up and down. You see where the beam is split with, with the small panels and how it's um, diverted through the studio. And um, because it's so massive parallel in, uh, in direction, you don't lose um, with the inverse square law. You have a very, very um, good efficiency in, in everything. Yeah, now we come to the final result. Here you go. And now back to Munich and Roman Hoffman will introduce you to the next part. Hi. So, hi, this is Roman from the Dito Weigert film team Munich and I'm here today on behalf of uh, actually Dedo Tech Russia. Uh, unfortunately, my colleague uh, Dima Andreev is uh, ill today, so I'm going to just um, uh, introduce a short introduction that they have prepared, a video. Just a couple of words about Dedotech Russia. Uh, Dedotech Russia is our agent. Um, they, uh, the team consists of uh, high professionals, but also very good salespeople. So Dedotech Russia is, um, on one hand, a sales 
point or a sales place, but on the other hand, also a very active uh, uh, consultation place. Um, main action areas um, where they are involved is cinema production, television production, of course, and a lot of uh, in the photo industry. So um, next is going to be a short video introduction um, from Datatech Russia itself. It's going to be a short video. And right after that, I hope we have uh, Pyotr Duchovskoy live here from Russia, from very deep Russia, uh, uh, a place called Gubacha, where he is shooting. So let's start with the video first from Datatech Russia. We are in the office of Datatech Russia. Our company supplies to Russian market film and television equipment, which promote by Data Viger Film. Among this product, uh, camera lens, uh, tripods, high-speed equipment, filters, uh, but the main subject of our activity are famous data light, uh, lighting equipment. Uh, company Datatech Russia has been working with Data Viger Film about 20 years. And during this time, uh, our company has organized a wide uh, network of uh, more than 20 dealers uh, who, are, who are selling our product uh, the west uh, territory of Russia, from the European part uh, to the Pacific Ocean. Every year we organize a presentation with our products uh, in the House of Cinema together with Data Vagat. This presentation uh, are always visited uh, by a lot of uh, ra leading Russian uh, cameramen. Data's uh, presentation uh, usually lasts until late uh, in the evening and uh, turn into friendly conversation between uh, film and uh, television professionals. Uh, the head of uh, company Del Vaget Film among Russian uh, operators is no longer Mr. Vaget, but simply Deda, uh, honorary member of uh, Guild of Operator of the Russian Universe, uh, of uh, Cinematographer and the winner of the White Square Award. Uh, as a cinematographer with experience, uh, Deda always find uh, an opportunity uh, to present uh, something new to colleagues. Uh, this can be optical attachment for highlighting uh, the eyes uh, in close-up, uh, equipment for uh, high-speed shooting or light stream system uh, what uh, eliminates uh, filming the location using single device uh, with several uh, reflectors. Let me show you our office. Uh, Deda Tech uh, Russia staff is not numeral. Our showroom is located in this hall. Uh, here we introduce our product uh, to our visitor. Our managers work uh, in this room too. Uh, next room accounting and one engineer room uh, which provides authorized uh, service of our product. Uh, this is especially important for a far away region of Russia. Uh, that uh, we help uh, them by mail. This is our wall, where diplomas uh, from numerous uh, Russian international exhibitions of film and uh, television equipment, as well uh, as a photo forum uh, held in Moscow. Uh, as a rule, we represent uh, our company uh, in the stand, where we demonstrated our classic equipment and uh, new products. Such exhibitions uh, help us uh, communicate with uh, our client uh, who live far away from uh, the capital. For Russia, the concept of far uh, can sometimes uh, be measured uh, in several thousand kilometers. For example, uh, we have a close cooperation with a city located in uh, the Arctic Circle, where the nights uh, last uh, for six months. Uh, there are cities where oil workers live. In such city, as a rule, uh, were well developed uh, television and even uh, film studio. Uh, you understand uh, how important light uh, for people uh, in the city where people don't see sun uh, for six months. We had a couple of uh, presentations uh, of uh, our lighting uh, there and uh, we have a good relationship uh, with them. Did the light again. Small size, low power consumption uh, is uh, most uh, equal to household load. In my part of television program uh, today are filmed in everyday condition in apartment, uh, schools, offices. Daylight uh, equipment uh, in Russia in recent years uh, has been uh, in category must have, especially on television. TV operators uh, are so used working uh, with uh, this device 
uh, that they come, uh, came up uh, with the nickname Dedic for them. Now, uh, company Dedwager Film has taken a new step uh, to design uh, to, for more compact, for more economy and more quality light with uh, uh, the in introduction uh, of a new light technology. Thank you. Меня зовут Петр Духовской, я кинооператор из России. За эти 20 лет снял 30 с чем-то художественных работ. Ну, обычно каждое новое кино э, возбуждает фантазию и ставится какие-то новые задачи, в том числе и световые. Вот этот замечательный прожектор с параллельным лучом э, открывает новые горизонты для оператора. Большое э, преимущество этого прибора в том, что действительно от одного источника, как от Солнца, можно э, разложить при помощи отражений, э, разложить всю световую схему. Да? При этом сам источник будет стоять э, за окном на улице, а внутри будут находиться только зеркала на компактных крепежах. Этот луч, э, этот источник, он э, получается похож на, э, на солнечный свет по своему характеру. Солнечный свет, который попадает э, в, в интерьер через какое-то маленькое окошко, да, и, и дальше отражается от разных стен э, и создает вот это э, магическое немножко ощущение. Свет какой-то в этот момент чудесный и волшебный. Источник сильный, при том, что э, лампа стоит всего 1200 ватт, и э, запитать ее можно от маленького походного генератора. Но луч такой, что он и на расстоянии 10, и на расстоянии 50 метров остается супер ярким. И его можно направлять и перераспределять зеркалами практически без потерь на разной дистанции. В результате мы, привыкшие к линзовым приборам, мы удивляемся, что здесь не работает принцип квадрата расстояния, да, когда освещенность падает в этой пропорции. Главное, что меня в этом привлекает, это то, что это очень интеллектуальная работа со светом, когда, когда ты математически и пространственно понимаешь, откуда какое переотражение должно прийти и какой оптимальный маршрут этому лучу света нужно составить. Я очень благодарен деду Вагерту за то, что он э, увлек меня этой идеей, за то, что он мне предоставил возможность э, приобрести в личное пользование такой прибор, который теперь украшает мою квартиру. Опять же, за это я благодарен деду Вагерту. Спасибо. Гутен Абент, добрый, я нахожусь в городе Губаки. Это на России, это около Урала. Я сейчас здесь снимаю детский фильм и прожектор параллельно. Russia is unfortunately not very good. We're switching back to Munich. Sorry for the inconvenience. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was a try and uh, Piotr, very, thank you very, very much uh, for being with us. We had a uh, uh, problems with the sound, but uh, Peter is really far away. Uh, he uh, it's 9 p.m. right now. He's 
what he wanted to sh uh, to say we were talking uh, beforehand before uh, the video stream is um, that he's actually shooting right now he had a day off today and for those who were probably too slow to read the subtitles of his wonderful movie about uh, the light stream um, system and the parallel uh, the pb70 um, just a couple of main uh, keywords uh, about what he was saying uh, Pötter is um, a very experienced cameraman shooting for 20 years. He was uh, involved in uh, 30, um, uh, round about 30 feature films. And um, he, of course, like um, any probably very uh, enthused cameraman, likes a lot uh, challenges. And for him, shooting with the PB70 um, was a new experience. And... Uh, the most uh, the most important message that he had is that especially the light character comes very close to the character of sunlight. Uh, this is because the beam is parallel, although um, the power consumption is very low. It's only 1.2K. It is going to go deeper into this later on. But uh, by having the parallel beam, um, we have almost the character of sunlight and are still very, very energy efficient. Um, the big advantage, uh, Petr said, is that uh, the light source itself, the PB70, can be positioned far away. So even at a distance of 50 meters, uh, the light intensity is still very, very high. And this gives uh, a big advantage on the set so that the light source itself can be positioned outside uh, the set itself. And then uh, the light can be reflected into the set. So actually having only one light source you, by using the live stream uh, reflectors, you can light the whole scene, not having the light actually close uh, to the set itself. And... Uh, Last but not least is uh, actually the big, big, um, let's say, as I already pointed out, it's uh, the character of the light. So this is what we often hear about the PB70. Um, we beat the square law. This is also what Pötter said, um, being used to focusable light to big light sources. It's amazing that this um, uh, light head produces um, so much light that you can position it far away and beat the square law. So this is the main um, message of what was said in the video. And I think we're up to now to go to Dedo Light, California. And I hope Sean is ready. All righty. Hopefully I'm coming in here clearly. Hi everyone, thank you Munich, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Sean Boyervin and this is the, I guess the quarantine studios from Los Angeles. This is Ditto Light California. We represent the United States very proudly. Um, and uh, I, I'm gonna try and make this as quick as I possibly can because I know we have, I know Ditto's gonna cover a lot of things and so I'm gonna be really, really short about a couple things. And what I would like to do here today is just show you some of the new and exciting light stream stuff that's coming out, as well as the um, uh, the Leadzilla and the smallest setup that you can do with the light stream. Because if you can see what you can do on the small scale, you can only go up from there. Uh, so I have that behind me. It's a little bit of demo. But first, what I'd like to do is switch over here and actually show you some of these new reflectors that are coming out. So bear with me one second here while I switch over. All right. So, as you can see here, uh, we have some really great new features with the Lightstream reflectors. I'm extremely happy to announce that now your reflectors will be coming with these uh, corner identifiers that also are uh, protectors. So when you're looking down uh, from the top of the pouch, you can actually see which reflector you're going for. This is the 25 centimeter uh, reflector that many of you already know. This is the 7 by 10 reflector that many of you know. And this is the new 12 by 15 size reflector in the number 5 finish, which really just creates a like a, an anamorphic shape of your uh, of your new beam. So if you're hitting it with a spot, it's going to make somewhat of a line. And I, I have to say, this is a really interesting reflector to work with because 
you can manipulate and play with this more than the other uh, the other reflectors. You can find edges, um, and you can do some really unique and interesting things. But anyway, that's the 12 by 15 size with the new corners, as you can see the identifiers. And um, I would say that uh, you could get these in the number one, two, three, four, and five finish. Uh, so we're looking really forward to uh, starting to get those out to you guys. Um, so I'm going to do this little Leadzilla um, uh, demonstration for you only because I want you to see uh, what this little Leadzilla can do with the new beam intensifier that we have. This is the DPBA0B7, I believe it is. If I'm wrong, data will correct me, I'm sure. Uh, so this is a beam intensifier now for a little 8 watt data light. And a couple of things that are going to be changing about the, the Leadzilla is that these um, friction knobs here on the yoke are going to change to become a little bit more robust because we're getting into some, um, some new mounts uh, for the Leadzilla that are maybe a little heavier, so we're going to be updating the, the um, tightening knobs there, okay? So uh, like all other uh, Leadzilla um, accessories, it, there's a little bayonet mount. It goes onto these little bolts here and then locks and twists into place, okay? And you have color changing and you have your dimming here. Uh, it's nice that it's a, a little, it's a shoe mount, uh, which makes it uh, really easy to grip with a lot of different tools. Anyway, so that is the Leadzilla with the new beam intensifier, which I'm gonna demo in just a second. But first, I want you all to question data later on about this new Lightstream light that's coming out. As you can see, I'm missing a number two here because I'm actually using it over in my demo right now. But Lightstream light is a new style of reflector we have not changed the finish. The finish is still the same. You have a one, two, and a three, and you're still gonna get those same results. However, what we've done is they've taken off the rigid backing to lighten them up, and we actually started to use shoe mounts on these. So I'm sure a lot of you are gonna be really excited to see that. I'm not gonna go into too much detail other than these little things are two ounces. So go ahead and try and imagine all the different gripping you can do with that reflector, okay? Now, I'm gonna go back over here and I'm just quickly going to go over this little light stream setup that I have to give you a sense of what it is you're going to be looking at in just a second, at least for the results. I've got my little Leadzilla here. Uh, right up in front of it, I have a number one little 7 by 10 centimeter reflector in order to redirect just a tiny little piece of that. And because it's an LED, you can get these reflectors up really close and, and not compromise the reflectors at all. I have a number two. 25 centimeter standard light stream reflector that you all may know or have, have researched before. This is a number two to get a little bit of a kick. And then I have up here the new light stream light number two, which is a 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter reflector. So it's a little bit smaller than the 25 by 25. This is gonna be a key light, all right? So let's go, go over, and the reason why it's a little dark right here is because I wanna isolate this light for you to sh show you just the results from just this light. So. Let me go over to this shot here from the, this little hero shot that I have. Okay. So uh, as I take position here, I, I want you to note that I've, I'm using Lightstream. So I can pretty much place my light where, wherever I want to, wherever it's convenient for me. Of course, you have things that are better than others. Some places better than others, but I'm going to dim this up here, turn it on and get it up, and bring it all the way. And. Uh, Maybe I'll adjust my color a little bit because it's better for my wrinkles. If I go a little warmer, perfect. Something like that, right around 4,000. Okay, so I have now two sources that I've created with a tiny little eight watt light. The most incredible thing about that beam intensifier is that that new spot is 400%. I believe it's around, Dato, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong here, 400% more output with that little beam intensifier on that little eight watt Leadzilla. So I'm actually able to use an 8 watt light for hours and hours, you know, depending on what you know, battery setup you have, if you want to use a battery or you can use AC for it. But I'm, I'm really pressing how far I can take a really, really small light source with the beam intensifier and start redirecting it and bouncing it and getting a couple of light sources that are effective. It's an effective little interview setup, you know? I'm not gonna say that you're not gonna do more. All I wanted to do is isolate what one light with one beam intensifier on the smallest light stream scale we can do, can do. So I have my, again, I have my key here. Now you can see the kick. And then I have the, should be getting the kick right around here. Yeah, something like that. Did I get it? 
should be gone. So you're seeing both of those isolated sources. Cool. Uh, I'm going to try and keep this short, so I'm going to sign off. But before I do, I would like to say thank you to the mothership over at Munich. Thank you, Data Light, and all of the employees over there who have been dealing with trying to get us all of our gear and every and all of our clients all their gear in a timely manner during this pandemic. It's just been it's been a crazy time for everybody. It's been extremely busy, thankfully, and. Um, we're really excited about the, the speed by which Lightstream and Reflected Light has been picking up. And we just want to take a moment to thank you guys for all the hard work that you guys are doing. Not unlike your lights, uh, you know, you guys seem to do, you know, one person seems to do the work of 10. And um, we just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for that. So signing off, and I'll, hopefully I'll be around later maybe to answer a few questions if anyone wants to reach me. Okay, take care. Welcome, I'm Dado. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll talk about creating images with a sense of space. This will not be a workshop. We will not have many image examples or lit scenes. Here I'm trying to explain the basics, the procedure and the practice and we'll try to build that step by step. Many actual examples you will find in our YouTube videos, or also now on Dato TV, which we will follow up with many more actual examples going deeply into individual aspects. Also, in good collaboration with our imaging colleagues, the famous Russian cameraman, Alexei Nosovsky, the creative Russian photographer Ilya Rashap, the British influencer and famous DOP, well known for his educational work, Ian Murray, also the talented and very knowledgeable French-Canadian Francois Aubry, and the practicing and experienced British DOP Pete Burns. So if there are any no uh, questions that need to be answered, we'll just go on with the prepared recordings uh, and we'll look at what questions come in and can answer them in between the different segments. There'll be eight or nine different segments of this. Thank you. Let's start step by step. Number one, the camera. Today, most cameras have a very high sensitivity and that could easily lead to the opinion that nobody needs any light anymore at all. To some extent, that is true. For mere exposure, we rarely ever need any additional light. Also, even our mobile phones are extremely capable and produce images of incredible quality. Most of the time though, the cameras used still work with one single eye and therefore mainly create two-dimensional images. Quite often that's perfectly okay as far as the lighting goes. But of course there are different approaches. Very often we can also find the light and with the extreme sensitivity of our sensors and cameras, that is very easy. Even in the darkest location, we can see detail. We have some unbelievable latitude to our images. So to a large extent, we definitely need less light and often we need no light. But then sometimes we do want to create the sensation of three-dimensionality, of space, of depth to our images. And for that, sometimes lighting and other tricks can contribute immensely. For similar images, similar framing, 
the different sensors need lenses with different focal lengths. Usually we find that on a very large sensor, we use lenses with a longer focal length. And the different focal length constitutes the depth of field. What is sharp from where to where. As an example, if we shoot full frame, or in the old days 35 mm film, with a Zeiss high-speed lens fully open, and we take a portrait close up, and we'll have a depth of field that is simply only two centimeters deep, less than one inch. So if we're looking for sharpness and definition, we really have to choose whether we want the left eye or the right eye to be in focus. If on the same lens, on the same camera, we stop down the iris, the depth of field will increase. Sometimes we do want to work with limited depth of field. It may be more suitable for the feeling of our image and therefore very often the senses as we have them today need some help by ND neutral density filters, gray filters, which reduce the amount of incoming light. At the same time, straightforward neutral density filters will allow a lot of infrared to enter and that distorts the response of the sensor. Therefore now, better neutral density filters are IRND filters, which diminish the amount of visible light as well as the invisible infrared that hits the sensor. If, however, we have an imaging device, a camera with a very small sensor, then this is very often used in combination with a short focal length lens, a wide angle lens, and then everything may very well be depicted in full focus, in sharpness, from here to the next village. At first sight, if we don't like this kind of image, this kind of character, there's not very much we can do about it. But later on, we will show some tricks and practices how to overcome that in many situations. Sometimes we can add to the character of the story that we want to tell by having images with a very selective sharpness. Thus, we can put accents on the foreground, on our talent, or on the background, and we can play with it and use it for dramatic effects. Um, not related to what we're talking about here, I see a question from James Rudd in England about the number five reflector. <clears throat> um, yes, we have that now. <clears throat> it's the fifth reflector surface that we're using. And it does add a spreading character that can be oriented in different directions. Uh, the same as we have on our lights, we have a optical device that also spreads the light and allows us, if we put several lights in a row, to create a river of light, which again influences the way people can move in the set without any change of intensity. But that's beside the point that we're trying to follow here. James, it's coming and there's much more to come. and you know where to reach me for any more detailed questions. And I enjoy the conversation with you. Thank you. And we go on with the next movie. Number two, the light on the talent. Again, in lighting, there are no rules. Different stories that we may want to tell and the lighting should serve the story and the intention and the character that we want to achieve. 
the light on the talent can be flat, frontal. If we look at the posters advertising perfume at the airport, we see beautiful ladies, and when we look at their eyes, we easily see reflected the two big breezer flashlight umbrellas. If you want to do this at home, very often people prefer a ring light. And it seems to light the face of the lady very smooth and very evenly. Personally, I don't like the reflection of the ring light in the eye. I think it gives it an alien look. But not many people look that closely. Sometimes we want to employ more character lighting. Every book and every film and media school talks about three-point lighting. Key light, fill light, backlight. And it used to be that there were strict rules to the intensity of the key light versus the intensity of the fill light. Today we have more liberty and more technical latitude with the capability of the sensor, which allows a pretty wide range of intensities to be depicted before any distortion or clipping of the image will occur. An endless variety of lighting styles can be employed. Now, let's think of the famous Malene Dietrich. Mr. Walker was her cameraman. Malene Dietrich herself was property of the studio. And the studio could decide to sell her or loan her to other studios for productions but it was in her contract that she couldn't be loaned out to other studios without being accompanied by Mr. Walker, who created the so-called North Light, a light pretty straight up in front of her face. And since Malene Dietrich was extremely disciplined, she could place herself and her face with great precision so that both of her cheekbones were perfectly accentuated by the shadow. In general practice, it was called the North Light. There's a wonderful book about it called The Light on Her Face. Usually in big Hollywood productions, there was the OB light, a gentle light rigged above the camera. Not named because it was above the lens, but named after the actress Mel Oberon. Other cameramen like Michael Ballhaus, moved the OB light below the lens to create a gentler eye reflex in the lower part of the eye, giving his women a particular very gentle feeling and a look of feminine beauty. I shot an entire movie about the reflection of light in the eye, the eye reflexes, and the different meanings which you can find also in our YouTube library. Okay, I see a number of questions. They have little to do with the subjects of what we are presenting here, but let me answer those anyhow. Um, can the intensifiers that we put in front of our lights also increase the output in infrared? Yes, they can. Um, and there is no uh, real filtering uh, that cuts down the intensity. Um, there's not a low pass filter in our optics. Um, yes, we have anti reflex coating in some of our optics, uh, but for some special purposes, like uh, Sergei in Moscow, we built HMI lights without our um, UV filters, which is dangerous. Yeah because we have the lowest UV content of any light on the planet. So for infrared, yes, it can be increased, but we don't have any photometrics for that because um, it's difficult to uh, publicize infrared photometrics. It's possible and there are scientific measurements that can prove that. Um, the other question is, um, 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 Mogens 
from Denmark is asking what is the difference between light bridge and um, data light light stream. Well, we're talking about reflectors <clears throat> and those are commonly available and have been used from the very first days of image creation. Um, the materials for the reflectors are commonly available. They can be bought in any country, anywhere in the world. The carrier material was invented for race cars in the 60s and we've been playing with it ever since. The reflective surfaces are laminated onto those and um, they're also commonly available uh, in household fluorescence and any kinds of lights. There's a rich catalog of those and anybody can buy those. And in the days when we were all one happy team of colleagues trying to work together, um, we were using the same materials like everybody. Um, the question is about the bounce board. Um, photometrically, the number four reflector uh, from our reflectors is um, very gentle and it has a spread of 90 to 120 degree. Um, so yes, that's very close to a bounce board, but it still has a slightly different character. Um, regarding the need of flags, that's an issue that you can easily cope with in a large team. Our big friends from Hollywood, they have big cars, <clears throat> generators, and four people will run in with four C-stands and four flags, and you can use that uh, any which way, similar on the light that is reflected, as well as on other lighting instruments. The question is whether you light a part of a reflector or the light beam, especially when we have a parallel beam, will still go above, under, left and right of the reflector. And for that, I've just now invented and patented. I swore myself I never make patents, they're too expensive, but I'm tempted. Uh, I've just patented a system that takes care of that and I'm eager to go into the studio and shoot that and show it to you because it's a wonderful system. And beyond that, we have another completely brand new tool that's unbelievable that can control parallel light. That's not easy to control. You know that. In flood, barn doors work. In spot, they do not work. But we now have conquered that with a completely new invention uh, that we'll be talking about, hopefully, as soon as we can get into the studio and shoot this. Um, so, there is, as uh, Sean from California says, also the control of the intensity, moving them in and out of the beam. So the parallel beam is really the key to it, and that's our addition. It's a p miracle piece. Let me take one example. The 400 watt HMI light, where we now have perfect color and perfect color all the way through the lifetime of the light. That was recognized twice by the Oscar Committee of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences for its optics. And that we can have a focus range of one to 20, where focusing lights, when they're small, have one to three, larger ones have one to six, we have one to 20. And thus we've always had a spot that had more reach, more power, more efficiency than anybody else. And now comes Miracle, we add a cooking pot in front, yeah, um, that we call parallel beam intensifier, yeah, and we don't change the exit angle, and that's the miracle. We have 500% more light output, and that's our contribution that so far has no equal worldwide. So that is the difference, as Morgan's already pointed out, we have the lights and 
we have always excelled in quality of the light, evenness, no hotspot, no color rings on the outside, extreme reach of the spot, and now we go beyond that, yeah, like the 400 watt light has a spot angle of four degree. Now we put this little cooking pot in front of it, we still remain at four degree and we have 500% more light. That allows and opens the doors wide to the world of reflected light. Um, so we can use a single light and kick it through a series of five, six, seven reflectors and light an entire scene. Uh, that's a challenge and it can be done. Uh, sometimes you want to add a second light and so on. And uh, there are more other tricks that you can do with the reflectors. But we already have a number of videos about this. Some of those are very artistic. They come from Francois from Canada. Uh, some of those just explain the system. <clears throat> some of those just explain the reflectors. And there are dozens of ways how these can be used. But that's not really today's subject. But I'm happy about the questions and it gives me the chance. Now there was the question, are there other reflectors? Comes from Norway. Dear Thomas, Alex has a request from your country, from Norway, where they want 30 by 40, 40 by 50 uh, rectangular reflectors. And we just sent out the offer yesterday um, for all of those other reflectors. And we've built them for, from Ian Murray for 75 by 75 centimeters. And we have them from small ones like this all the way through uh, one by one meter. We've not gone in size above the one by one meter, but there are some surprises coming in the near future. And we can make everything in between, but we've got to keep it a little bit in an order. So I think we have five different sizes right now. And then we build completely different approaches where we just make the very lightweight reflector. And that's light stream light. That's a view into the future. Sean already mentioned that. And that's a new approach. Um, basically same function as everything else that we've had before, but much easier to mount where you can have a tiny little clamp and then you have an arm that you can bend in any way that you want and attach the reflector anywhere. And there are even strange ways of attaching them for the, not for the big brothers in Hollywood. No, Steve Poster, Roy Wagner, not your tools. This is for the refugees like me. This is for the solo creator, a very, very small team and we cater to them, and that's what Lightstream Light is doing, and we're just introducing that now, and we're hoping that people like James and others, um, and Tibor, who also joined the conversation from Hungary, will shoot wonderful videos how to use that and how to explain it. So before I get accused by Michael from Düsseldorf that I'm always talking too much and too long, let's go back to the schedule that we'd set up. Thank you. Number three, the story, the style for the lighting. There are no general rules that can be applied at all times. The character of the lighting has to serve the story. It can be noticeable with high contrast. Lighting teachers often mention in the sense Caravaggio paintings or even in my mind, El Greco paintings. You will find a lot of the high contrast lighting in the early German Expressionist films. There could also be unnoticeable lighting, like it was introduced first and used in the Nouvelle Vague in France by Raoul Coutard, where people had the feeling that no lighting was used at all, which certainly was not true. It was just a high density diffusion material all over the ceiling. And I'm still amazed by the concept of Professor Kalisch, a friend and a Czech cameraman who shot a lot of series for German television. He used the same kind of lighting 
but he placed large black covers over the diffuser on the ceiling so that no straight down light was used, but the light came more from an unnoticeable angle all around the talent. To me, that was a much more advanced version of the unnoticeable lighting. Um, again, totally off the subject again, but going the same direction. Um, I love that question, Toby Martin. Interesting. Um, reflector, soft light, hard light. Now, the appearance uh, of a hard light is based on the size of the light emitting surface. If you have a hard reflector, like a number one, and a small size, and you place that very close, um, it may be reasonably soft, but it's not really spreading the light. It is just redirecting the light. Whilst others have another exit angle of 12 degree or 30 degree or about 100 degree coming close to the effect of a beadboard or a styrofoam. Uh, <clears throat> but what is hard light, what is soft light, is only defined by the size of the light source. If the light source is small, it can be very hard when it's far away. It can be a little bit softer, and the shadow definition, the shadow edges disappear the closer you come. Um, let me give you an extreme example. There is a light source that creates a very, very hard shadow. It has a diameter of 130 million kilometers. That's the sun. Yeah. So that's a huge soft light that you can dream of, but put the soft light far away. Yeah. So then it enters the, the discussion about the square law. Um, when you're close to a soft light, the square law doesn't seem to apply. When you're like uh, two and a half times the diameter of the soft light in distance, uh, it starts applying again, gently and then stronger. <coughs> so soft light, hard light is whether I have a tiny light source. And that's why in the old days, when they were using more direct light in Hollywood, they had lights with a big lens like this. But that wasn't good enough. So they had 10Ks that had a super large lens called Big Eye 10. And they used them close to the talent and they cooked the talent. But the shadow definition was a little bit softer and gentler. So from the same distance, if I use this reflector, I will usually have the impression of a hard light. If I use this type of a reflector, yeah, it will, in close proximity, be hard, place it far enough away, and it'll be a hard light. Um, and one of the inventions that I'm talking about where I'm having a new patent is something that photographers used to ask me about, and I understand nothing about photography. That's, can you have a soft light? that has inside a focusing light. I wouldn't know how to do that, and I didn't pursue it because I just had, had no idea how to build it. Now, we're building it. That's the new thing that we're gonna show in the studio. Uh, we'll have a soft light that can be used at considerable distance, and we have a focusing light <coughs> right within it, but it's not a focusing light. It's part of the new development of uh, data light light stream. And one of the purposes to be followed, not again for the rich, yeah, Roy Wagner, Julio Macat, who have everything, big trucks and trucks and more people and more people and space and money, um, 
We, the poor refugees, we work on smaller stages and then they're easily cluttered by all kinds of uh, lighting paraphernalia. We want to do away with those. So this combination of soft light and hard light will be done on one single lighting stand or you can hang it up from one suspension. So that's exciting, but I'm not talking about it yet. Wait until we've been to the studio and we shoot it. Okay, in the meantime, forgive me. Let's go on with some of the other videos that we prepared. Um, have you organized a good price list for our stealers? Simple. Number four, separating the talent from the background. Now we may want to direct the attention of our viewer towards the talent and not have it distracted by things happening or being shown in the background. I would love to show images and we would love to create them together, like in a workshop. But then please understand that this is merely an introduction to some of the subjects we want to show in more detail later on. Therefore, I have to direct you towards all the tutorials that we have on YouTube and on Dado TV. We can guide you if you have particular questions on particular subjects of interest. Now, one way to separate the talent from the background, of course, is the limited depth of field of the longer focal length lens and a wider opening of the aperture. The backlight and possibly the hair light contributes to this separation. The kicker, usually placed diagonally across the key light, can also provide some separation from the background and at the same time may add to the three-dimensionality of the character that we want to depict. Uh, some new questions, again, going all different directions. Um, Morgan's the price list. Um, Marco is the master of creating the price lists. But you and your super talented people should be able to convert all the currencies uh, in an easy Excel uh, extension of our price lists. And I think we can help you on that. Um, James Rudd, England. I, I, I respect you very, very much, uh, but you have, we have to talk about it uh, because I don't understand the question. You have to help me. I'm just a relatively simple cameraman from the backwoods of Bavaria. Um, this sounds interesting, but I don't have an answer on that. Uh, Toby, yes, there's much more to it. And if you want to, let's talk. And hopefully pretty soon for those interest groups, we can get together in a Zoom meeting in a smaller circle and anybody can join for those. Uh, but today there's Michael Quack in Düsseldorf and he complains that I'm always talking too much. So um, let's try and get through it. Ah, Rory on a bike. I don't understand that question. Write to my email. Dave Weigert at datoweigertfilm.de Our garage sale list, the special sale, is available worldwide. So now again, with some significant changes in the USA, uh, USA is part of our world again, hopefully. Uh, and that's wonderful. And we love that. Um, okay, let's go on with the next uh, session. Number five, the introduction of space. In the huge studio, in the big set, that can be provided by the character of the set. In the early days of filmmaking, the illusion of huge sets could be complemented by some tricks. You had the scene in the huge opera house, the stage, was shown in reality only on the lower part of the set. Or the upper part of the set 
with a huge dome was built as a model and a mirror was used to implant the illusion of the upper part of the set. Sounds quite easy, but there was a great master, a DOP called Eugen Schuftan. Everybody watched him and his technology was used very often. And every time somebody said, I've understood, I can do it myself. But in the end, they always called him. He locked the studio at night and worked on his own to create the integration of the realistic lower part of the set into the part of the model that was mirrored. Today, all of those things can be done in virtual imaging, in digital image creation and visual effects. But the larger scale of such creative work is usually reserved for the big money blockbuster production. So now we want to direct our attention more to the easy creation of such realisms or the illusion of those, even in the smallest space. Where many of us work with limited budgets in limited locations. We can possibly create the feeling and the magic of huge spaces, even if we shoot restricted to grandmother's kitchen. That and some other tricks and practices will be the main subject of today. Um, again, some questions that don't relate much to what we're talking about in the videos. Um, it's been called Summer Sale. Um, you can always address the local an exclusive agent and they will help you on this they receive our so-called garage sale list we put that together as a support for the many in our profession that are ailing that are having serious problems um, because of the pandemic and the serious restrictions in our work uh, there are many who have not been able to shoot at all. There are many studios that were closed down completely and others work under incredible difficulties. So we tried to pull together everything we can and we put it into what we call garage sale list, which is available on our website. Um, and that goes worldwide, India, everywhere, even to Finland, at minus 15. Come on, you're a beginner. I shot in Igloo Lik. That's Eskimos. I shot two weeks at minus 60. So come on, you can do better than minus 15. That's measly. Yeah. <laughs> That's all part of global warming that doesn't exist, as we know from the previous pre president. Uh, okay. So, um, but your local agent can help you. We can help you through the local agent, but we're also open for any direct inquiry and we're getting a number of those too. And we're opening both doors through the responsible distributor, like you've seen in some of the answers already. And here we have the freedom with this special activity just for the pandemic situation to go also direct, whichever way you choose, uh, there'll be no disadvantage of any kind. Okay. Um, we do the mobile power supply for Dado. Yes, um, that's the last thing that came in. That's a new battery technology because no airplane will take lithium ion batteries and even trucks don't take those anymore. So this is a new technology called lithium iron and the wonder machine is called RV, <clears throat> and it does absolute marvels because from one single RV, the basic unit, which can be expanded no end, you can drive um, 20 of my DLED three lights for two hours. Um, so that's an incredible battery uh, solution. 
and it goes even more green and we want to be ahead of everybody else in media green tech uh, you also charge it with solar panels and you can charge it whilst you're driving by sticking the solar panel on the roof of your car uh, sorry different um, subject okay let's go back six projecting structured color effects some stories may be well served by the creation of an undefinable abstract background. When we're employing a longer focal length lens at wider iris opening, the reflections that may be created in the lens from small reflexes in the picture and are not prevented from entering the lens, these small reflexes or lens flares or out of focus reflexes often today are called by the aspiring image creators the bouquet. Wonderful, moody feelings, often depicting a very gentle array of flower-like shapes based on the shape of the iris in the lens, but here gentle and flowing and adding to a particular mood. If we work in a room with a neutral wall behind the talent, we can also project abstract patterns with our lights, our images, and the versatile array of our background effect filters. Showing different colors, different structures, and again, those we can pull more or less out of focus to create the feeling of a further distance behind the talent. Here we may also create the feeling that cooler background projections may possibly give the feeling of a larger distance rather than background projections matching the color temperature of the lighting on the talent. Um, question about where to find the information from IME. Yes, we have a very serious um, presence and a lot of followers on the YouTube channel that Marco Edman is managing. And there's also Dado TV. They go in parallel. Dado TV goes on Vimeo uh, and YouTube. You can find over 200 of our educational tutorials. Some of those just describe products. Some of those describe basic understanding and procedures. And we feel deeply dedicated to the educational approach. Because when I started, there was no film school in Germany. So I had to find mentors, and I'm forever greatly grateful to them. And they took great patience. And a lot of what I learned was from them and the time they gave to me. So we feel obliged and dedicated to put out whatever we learn, whatever we experience in our videos. And Marco is the one who has for years put those onto the YouTube channel and Dado TV uh, also is there in parallel. So go one way or another and you find it. And also on our website, you will find a number of those. So yes, there is collaboration. Now, Mogens, those filters exist um, for the DLED 9 also, which is the Series 400 wouldn't last too long on an HMI light, but it will last on the DLED 9 forever. And it performs the same miracles. It's available anytime, order it, you'll get it, I hope. Uh, with, we're a little bit hampered by, by the restrictions and the pandemic period. We keep the company open, we're there for you any day from 8 to 6 p.m. Munich time. Uh, but some people are here on Monday, others on Tuesday, others have home office. So sometimes it takes a little bit long longer. Um, um, so, Fuad, putting color gels in front of the reflectors. Yes, very good question. I've always been afraid to do that because I'm afraid that the not absolutely flat mirror-like surface of the gel may cause some 
distortion and the reflection. But you can definitely put it on the light and on the big PB70, yeah, which puts out more light with a measly 1.2 kilowatt than a 9K Arian spot. Um, on that, you can put any kind of reflector, uh, gel, and you can portion it off. And Reflectric, the guys from England have done that to create half of it in warm color via the gel and the other. On the reflectors, I have to admit, I still have to do that. I have not played with it myself. So I always wanted that answer and I haven't done it yet. Sorry. Here we go. Number seven, gobo projections. Now, usually you see the Louvre gobo, which we see in each and every TV series, but there are over 600 different gobos. Many of those are to be found from Roscoe. They're not expensive and they allow to create the feeling of images projected that may have to do with realistic shadow patterns or abstract shadow patterns. And depending on the softness of focus of the projection, again, this can transmit the feeling of space and distance. Out of focus leaf patterns may give the feeling of lighting in a park at a huge distance. The more you create sharp and in-focus backgrounds, the closer they seem to appear. It is also possible to create a sandwich with a colored background effect filter and a gobo, which may possibly offer the feeling of two separate layers of depth to the image, even in the smallest space. Okay, I think we're up to date with the questions. Um, so again, so Michael doesn't kick me again, step on my toe. Um, let's go on with the last video. I think the last one is coming up. Right. Projecting images onto a background. We can go much deeper into the illusion of space and backgrounds by projecting images on a neutral background. This can give the feeling of a realistic space behind the talent, or it can convey the illusion of all kinds of different locations, situations and moods. Such projections can be done in high quality and with high resolution by using slides of different sizes and with different motifs. But these days the production of photographic slides is more complex and takes time and may not be readily available. That's why there is a super quick and easy approach to create similar effects. When we're not shooting a multi-million dollar blockbuster in the big studio, if we work in tiny spaces, practical locations, with a small team and limited time and money, we can use a quick and easy method. We can choose any desired image or take one with our cell phone. We print it out on a color printer on a transparent gel. This does not have to be a heat resisting gel. We cut the gel, insert it into the projection device and project the image easy, quick and effective. Such gel projections will not provide full color saturation. They will have lower contrast, but this on its own may very well contribute to the illusion of a background being further away. Alex Berkovich, an experienced director of photography, is part of our team. And when he takes a video of me in front of such a projected background, I always complain that he's not lighting me with sufficient contrast. And then Alex says he will add the contrast in post-production. This may very well be done, and we can show examples of how this can work. 
At the same time, I feel that sometimes the softer focus and lower contrast on the background projection, when we're working with such projected gels, can add to the illusion of depth and space. Thus, Alex and I have different perceptions, and it's most probably perfectly true that each of our working procedures has its own value and its own justification. I remember older days when Rune Eriksson and I were introducing Super 16 for blow-up for the big screens. Yes, that could be done. And if, if you took sufficient care, the results could be extremely convincing, as they were shown in the wonderful comparisons of movies shot on 35mm film with Panavision cameras, side by side with Super 16 Aton cameras for blow-up. These wonderful tests in those days were done by Duart, a laboratory in New York, and the wonderful owner Irving Young, whose brother also was a famous filmmaker, Robert Young. In practical life, not all of the Super 16 productions which were blown up for the big screen looked like a million dollar production. Because people tried to save money and they didn't have enough knowledge or didn't take enough care to observe each step with utmost care. Sometimes the blow-up even looked amateurish. Looked like it was shot on Super 8, especially when the scene was lacking contrast. I particularly remember a scene in the snow with an overcast sky and it looked like grain soup. But the very moment you put a fence post in the foreground, hard side light and higher contrast, the entire picture all of a sudden looked very different. And the whole picture was perceived as being high resolution and in focus. In other words, the creation of a defined foreground that may possibly separate in resolution and contrast from the remainder of the picture that may very well be perceived to draw the attention to the talent and create the illusion of a bigger space, better resolution, and a more interesting image. This is only one working method that could apply to the projected artificial backgrounds and the lighting of the talent in the foreground. Let's look at both ways. We will shoot it the way Alex wants to do, with less contrast on me, and enhancing the image in post-production. The other way that I would suggest would be to light the person, in this case me, with a higher contrast, and leave the background in gentle depiction with less contrast Thus, I feel it could be perceived as drawing more attention to the person in the front, against the background. Again, there are no defined rules how to create a picture, how to perceive a picture, and how to do the lighting. All we're trying to do is to show different approaches and the results that you may choose from in your own practice. If for the background we project an abstract pattern and pull this out of focus, it is a completely different approach to the creation of depth and three-dimensionality rather than having images in the background projection with defined recognizable objects, which when shown out of focus may add more to the feeling of distance of space and the illusion of a three-dimensional world. A uh, question from Richard Kraft. Mm. Very good question, and it's very easy to answer. Here we are. You can record the images on your iPhone. No problem. Then you go to any kind of color printer, an office color printer, and you print it out. Uh, you print it on any kind of transparent gel. It doesn't have to be heat-resistant gel. 
like you, we used to be able to buy for the overhead projectors. And especially on the LED lights and their projection attachments, any kind of transparent gel will work perfectly okay. You do not get full black. You do not get full color saturation. But the desaturated colors even help the illusion of a background that's further away, that's at a distance, seen through a little bit of a haze, like Paris, late October, the moisture in the air, the sunlight coming through the Seine uh, mist, and all women look like they're painted by Renoir. Uh, so the backgrounds really work beautifully. Now, the only thing you have is when you project straight onto the background, that's fine. Any image will do immediately. When you project from an angle, so you want to avoid in grandmother's kitchen to hit the talent, the person in front of your camera, with a projection, then the image will be distorted. The far side will be larger, the near side will be smaller, and that's called keystoning. So then every young person today can go into Photoshop or similar software and they can distort the image, and I call that negative keystoning. Um, and um, then you print it out again, and we can give you the angles, like the, the angles uh, for most of our common lenses are like 10 degree on top and bottom. Try and keep that out of the projected image, make the image larger so that the cutoff does not project with it, and it's easily done for any kind of angle. We can give you the whole lists of how to do that. And supposedly we also have a button that I didn't understand because some of the wording from my computer gurus was not um, common to me. That's a new speak of uh, Photoshop people. They understand that I'm just a simple cameraman and I talk about projecting images and not mock-up templates, what they use, perfectly useful in the modern speak, but I'm talking about projection and images and distortion and keystoning, and that's easily done. Now, um, the new lightweight version of Lightstream uh, in the USA, it's already there. Sean showed it to you, and we're ready to ship. Um, and that's wonderful for the solo creator. Now, to come back to Aimee, I don't know where you are, you seem to claim that you're of the new generation of the small creators. I said, okay, you want more information? Go to YouTube, go to Dado TV. But also, if you want to cooperate with me, let me know. We've done this all over the world. And this is where Sean, he's just holding up the light stream light. Look there in the picture. Um, um, number three, that doesn't have number four and five. It's only got number one, two, three. Um, but it works marvels. So if you want to, like we have many um, creators all over the world, and often we send them some equipment and we say, you shoot the videos. And we will use them again to educate your friends by putting them on YouTube, putting them on Dado TV, and you can publicize the hell out of them uh, just to let the rest of the world know what you found because <coughs> everybody, and this is where I follow Alex Berkovich when he does a lighting seminar He's talking very seriously, puts up a straight face, and says, the rules of lighting. Rule number one, there is no rule. So everybody finds his own solution. And that's exciting, and that's wonderful, and that's part of the miracles of our profession. And it's a wonderful profession, and everybody interprets it in his way, and everybody has a different opinion, and we've been admiring 
all the people involved and we're in very close contact to some of the top guys in Hollywood and we're in excellent contact with some of the students and we used to have up to 12 interns in my company and we tried to see that they learned a lot. From the initial uh, show where cinematographers talk about Edolite, there were a lot of our ex-interns who learned from us. So we're trying to disseminate and teach and we have helpers like Michael was just holding up the little reflector. He's part of the collaborators where you can go, look, learn, work with them and usually unless you take away the ground coffee, um, they will help you in your creations and to explore and try out the tools that we've created. And that's the only kind of fun I have because also I'm an, I'm an old dinosaur, I admit that. But um, playing in the sandbox, anybody's invited to come any kind of criticism, any kind of suggestion, feel welcome. And that's not going to change as long as I'm around, hopefully for a little more while, um, and then feel invited. Any other questions? Uh, light stream available? Yes. Uh, most of the printers that we've used uh, inkjet printers, yes, is okay, but when you project it, you will see little uh, uh, pixels. And you can be artistic about the explanation, saying that's like a pointillist painting from Signac or Seurat or uh, those painters. Um, but when you pull it, there's a little bit out of focus that disappears if you don't like to see it. Um, okay. And acrylic mirrors are fine, but then you don't have the, that sounds like a Japanese um, entry. Um, they don't give you the different spread angles. Yeah, they just give you one angle. Uh, Sean is just demonstrating the number one, I guess. That's redirecting the light, no change, whilst the others have 12, 30, 90 degree spread angle and that makes the difference of the light stream reflectors over mirrors that can also be used and be very useful. Thank you. Sean, you want to say something? Sean? We have no sound from you, Sean. We have no sound from you, Sean. Hello. Oh yeah. Uh, there's Check. Audio back. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, audio back. Uh, I think I only saw one question over here as to as to whether or not we're going to have live stream light here in the U.S. Yes, we are going to have it. It is on the way. Uh, Dato and uh, the crew has been working um, very diligently to get these to us. So we have kits of these coming, and it's very exciting because of the amount of grip materials that you have to utilize these really lightweight. Um, reflectors. Um, so yes, to answer that question, we are going to be um, receiving these very, very soon. And uh, we're excited to be able to get them to you. I should also say, again, that the 12 by 15 reflectors are coming in, and the number five reflectors as well.
Okay, everybody. So you can demo the stuff in okay, Munich, everybody. of course, so at Dado's place. And uh, Düsseldorf is uh, another opportunity for you. And you also get um, a number of things you can look at. We have um, a wide array of uh, Dado light, and uh, we're happy to, put on, uh, to show you what we have. Come and see us. Am I on again or? Yes, you're live. Okay. Thank you for everybody. As you've seen, I'm not totally familiar because I don't really know when I'm on and others are on. Uh, forgive me. Thank you, Sean. Wonderful. Thank you, Dima and Peter from Moscow. Thanks. For Thank our you, my friend. patient and wonderful and capable Düsseldorf team, you've done well. You invest a lot Thanks of time everybody. and effort in We're this, and it's very much appreciated. And I'm very grateful for this partnership. It means a lot to us. And again, anybody who wants, feel invited for questions, suggestions, criticism, input, ideas, and dreams because I'm the little kid in the sandbox. Anybody who wants to jump in and play with me is welcome anytime, as long as I'm around. So hurry up um, and join, and we'll create wonderful new toys and tools. Thank you so much. You get to bounce it into different textures and that produces a really interesting result. For example, when you go into a mirror, you polarise the light and you get very hard shadows, actually harder than you'd get if the light was direct. So um, you get these sort of polarised uh, 